Hello and welcome to Youth on the Money. I'm Hans Devines and I'm honored to be your host today to take you through today's discussion. Many young people in Trinidad and Tobago believe that government's decisions don't affect their lives. Today, I'm sitting down with seven young people to challenge that idea. We'll talk to them and find out how the 2020-2021 budget impacts them in a very practical sense. In layman's terms, what they see in the budget for young people like you. Thank you very much. It is indeed with more than usual pleasure that I welcome this youthful, youth-filled panel to have the conversation entitled Youth on the Money. The budget 2020-2021 was delivered some time ago by the Minister of Finance to and for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It was clear to me that a large chunk of that budget related directly to the affairs of youth and even more directly to the youth agenda within the mandate of the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. In this regard, and for appropriateness and correctness, a decision was taken by this ministry to allow you, members of this youth panel, to come together to analyze the budget statement, to analyze the budget documents, to look at the Vision 2030 document, to look at the roadmap for recovery post-COVID committee's report, and to find in it the issues that impact you, the young people of Trinidad and Tobago, who, as we have declared truthfully, is extremely important to us as a government and to all of Trinidad and Tobago for, to my mind, obvious reasons. So your job, as I welcome you, is to speak to the young people of Trinidad and Tobago, identifying in your youthful way what this holds out for them in the context of the National Youth Agenda. So I welcome you and I bid you good luck as you do this in your contribution of what I referred to as the first display of national service to the youth and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, good luck, and I look forward to your deliberations with great anticipation. Thank you. My name is Kevin Valley. I am actually in the business of capital raising. More specifically, I help companies annual revenues say between 1 million and 25 million US access the capital they need to grow and scale their businesses. Now this includes everything from unpacking their pitch, their customer strength and everything to provide a, to prepare a credible investment proposal that we present to investors as well as a credible valuation. Thank you very much, Mr. Valley. We now head to my right, Mr. Senon. Thank you very much, Hans. Greetings, everyone. I am Alpha Senon, founder and executive director of Y Farm. We help Youth Farm, um, an NGO that pioneers agricultural educational entertainment, ensuring that our children in, uh, know that they are the ones to feed us in the future, that they take up careers in agriculture, and we develop the agribusiness sector so that it's youth friendly, it's, 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 it's creative, and it's innovative in a way that young people could find their space in the agricultural value chain. So we are all about food freedom, we are all about sustainability, and we are all about advocating for young people in agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. Senan. We move across to Ms. Martha Antoine. My name is Martha Antoine. I am an anthropologist at the National Center for Persons with Disabilities. And I am also aspiring to be a self-advocate to, to become. I am thankful to for this the opportunity to be here today and hope it will be a learning experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Martha, we now go across to Khadija Grant. 
Greetings everyone, my name is Kadisha Grant. I am 23 years old. I am a mother. I am also the Vice Chairman of the San Fernando East Youth League and I am very thankful to be here today to be able to have a positive impact and to give valuable information to the young individuals of Trinidad and Tobago because I believe that the youth, they need a voice, they need a platform for all their issues and concerns to be heard and I'm happy to be here to be a part of that voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khadija. And this definitely is one of those platforms. We now go across to Isaiah John. Hi, good day. My name is Isaiah John. I'm a teaching artist for the Roots Foundation. I have been doing spoken word for five years and community work as well. So thank, thank you for the opportunity for being here. You now go across to Richie Bansraj. Hi, good day, everyone. My name is Richie Bansraj. I am a representative or a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Martial Arts Stricken um, Group. I was a formerly a member of the UE Stricken Society, which is a, also an NGO group. So I'm here to push for young people who are into that type of sport, martial arts and these things, so that they could come out to have something other than football, cricket, stuff like that, that they want to do as a sport and make it a part of their lifestyle. Thank you very much, Richie. We now go across to Shanice Nayak. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Shanice Nayak, the reigning Miss Global Trinidad and Tobago Queen. With this title, I am not just a beauty queen. I am an advocate for cause and a passionate spokesperson. With this title and platform, I intend to use it as an impetus to act on the lives of our youths with any charity acts, outreach programs, or activism pro prospects that we can do as a holistic target towards our youths in this nation. Thank you very much. Now that we know our panel, let's take a little look at the background of today's discussion. Each year, government presents a national budget as a financial forecast for the year ahead. It is the government's anticipated income and expenditure for the year ahead and a way of balancing our country's limitless needs with, limitle with limited funds. For this fiscal 2020-2021, the total expenditure is approximately $56.8 billion. As you are aware, in August, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, my DNS, was established and subsequently allocated $232 million, from which to deliver programs and services to youth across Trinidad and Tobago. In addition to this, there were specific provisions for young people in the areas of business, housing and health, and agriculture, just to name a few. So let's get straight into it, panel. What are your thoughts, your overall thoughts on the 2020-2021 budget? Shanice, we'll start with. I believe we could achieve a lot with it. Um, currently, with the pandemic, I believe a lot of youths are suffering from mental health disorders, eating disorders, um, lack of education, access, and I believe that with a majority of this fund, we'll be able to help youths you know, gain access to their education and help themselves at home with any sort of domestic discomfort that they may be facing at this current time. All right. That's thank you, Shanice. Richie, what about you? Well, the budget this year to me in my perspective was a bit it was bittersweet it had some cuts in certain places that that will given the circumstances of the economy will hap were about to happen then we have some good things like the ministry getting an actual budget to work with and we could push for things for young people but at the same time we need to try to include more detail as to what it is that we want to do these things in, monitor and evaluation, um, proper funds, these things. But they have these systems in place, so it is bare bones, but it is there. And that is what I'm excited for with that budget, so it is positive. All right, Isaiah. Certain cuts were needed to be made where they were, where they were made, you know, and as Rishi said, the M&E is a very important aspect of the youth, the whole youth development program, and we need more of that. So I appreciate the funds that was allocated to the youth development. All right, Khadija. My overall perspective on the budget is that it was a it was a great budget. I was very excited to see that youth is given a more 
direct focus, that more attention is being paid to the young persons of the country. And I think that was excellent. But then the cuts that were made, for example, with the different changes with GATE, I know that a lot of young persons were a bit you know, disenchanted with that decision, but it was necessary and understandable. So I think from there we could work on moving forward and seeing where this budget takes us. All right, thank you, Khadija. How about you, Martha? It was a good one because I know it was a difficult task trying to run the country resource with limited resources. I think some areas could have been given more attention, such as the process of receiving the special grants. Children, kids with special needs could, could be able to access it a little more easier and stuff like that. All right, thank you very much, Martha. Alpha, $500 million stimulus package for agriculture. Your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, still some bit of um, uncertainty about how I feel about it generally. Um, I feel like echoing one of the sentiments of one of my colleagues who shared before, as though you know, more plans could have been mentioned. And I feel like if we're still waiting to hear about some of these plans, you know, getting a, a bigger allocation in some areas is one thing. What you do with the allocation is another thing, right? Um, I think uh, there's definite need, definite need for more civil society engagement, because you know, the civil society organizations are the ones on the ground and they understand exactly what is happening in the communities precisely. Mr. Kevin Valley. Yeah, um, so I I'm, I'm, I'm more want to focus on the essence of the budget rather than just like the, um, the minute details. And I think the essence of the budget is definitely in the right direction. You know, you're, you're encouraging entrepreneurship, technological innovation, um, investment in youth. All of these things are very futuristic, right? You're looking into your future, you're trying to set a platform for the future. And I mean, I, I always say that we, we must be mindful that the government, the, the government's role in setting the budget is to foster an environment for us to, to do what we need to do, to take the economy forward. But it, the impetus is really on the private sector and us as private individuals to, you know, to take that mantle and lead, lead the thrust for, for growth and everything. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Kevin Valley. Martha, I wanna, I wanna start with you in terms of this next question. What aspects of the budget do you see personally affecting you? It didn't really affect me, but as, like I said, the, whole, the process of getting it could be easier. Because when I had one for months, they told us we need to like, gather up more documents. And I think that special needs to remember going for the grant, they shouldn't be like, able, they shouldn't be... It shouldn't be that difficult. Yeah, it shouldn't be that difficult. Thank you very much, Martha. Mm -hmm. Richie, what about you? More or less, I would say the agriculture stimulus package was good because it pushed for the use of technology and they, they, they will mention that the use of technology and that will affect me personally because I'll get cheaper food, cheaper healthy food. Khadija, we'll move across to you. Um, like I would have stated in my introduction, I am a mother. My son is two years old and currently I am in between jobs, so I'm currently unemployed. What would have sparked a special touch for me, of course, would be the changes in GATE because I am interested in going back to school, probably getting my degree, getting my master's done. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that I would be paying special attention to. And also, with regards to schooling, you know, digital transformation is taking place. Everything now is becoming more computerized and modernized, you know, everything now is being done from the comforts of your home. So I'm still waiting to see what the changes would, would be for the future when it comes to children returning to school or if they would be returning to school based on the pandemic to see what is happening, how is Trinidad and Tobago moving forward, is it that our numbers is decreasing? Because then when I do become gainfully employed and then as a single parent, my son has school, you know, is it that these daycare and the childhood centers would now be training their personnel to probably take over looking after children whose parents are working and of course, having children to study online in schools. So 
still waiting to see what the options are like and how we could move forward to benefit, of course, all parents, not just single parents, because I mean, if you need to work to get income to support your family. So I'm interested in seeing how that would change in the upcoming future. A deep and real concern. Shanice, you're actually studying. What do you see in the budget personally affecting you and how? So I think that having the cuts in the budget to our access to education is very much discouraging and demotivating, as I said. The allocations towards the agriculture, the agriculture stimulus package. I believe we need to have a lot of monitoring and surveillance in that aspect because time and time again, whether or not it's decreased or increased, you tend to see that our imports are remaining the same. All right. Let me hear on this side of the table, you all can go ahead, let me hear. You know, what areas do you all see personally impacting on you? The entertainment industry has took a big, very big hit this whole, during this whole pandemic. And for us, no, no, like for real, for real, you see a laugh, but it's for real, like, you know, you know, hands, you know what I'm talking about, so the entertainment. <laughs> industry but you know but, but here he here though so right <laughs> so the entertainment industry has stuck on a big hit um but for artists the like artists like us who are who you could say are not registered under the artist registry because grants are only given to the artists who are under the artist registry and even self we say we're going on our cools register for the artist registry to take a whole However long the process, because I have friends who registered and they still haven't got a call or email yet to say, yo, you're accredited, you could, yeah, so that is a big... And then obviously the question would be, is the grant enough for people in entertainment as well? Real questions. Mr. Valley. What I would like to see is um, more investment in actually stimulating business growth. And it's not just growth from funds circulating within the economy. We have to attract funds from outside the economy, right? And to do that, we have to, again, make our businesses better. But some may ask, Mr. Valley, if the funding that we have there hasn't been used or utilized, because some will say we have so many programs that contribute to businesses in Trinidad and Tobago. So what do you say to that? And also, is it that we are looking for jobs rather than creating jobs as a generation? Thank you, man. All right, so, so the first thing, and remember, remember when I opened my first point was that the government is there to create an environment. The budget creates an environment, but it's up to the private sector for us to take, take that environment, take that whatever funds allocated to us, and, and go create, go create and build and multiply and scale. What other areas of the budget do you think could have been adjusted to serve your field? Now, I must say, though, that I have heard um, about a two-acre homestead that, that, that the Prime Minister mentioned it, the Minister of Agriculture mentioned it as well, that would be available to young people. This in particular is very, very, very beneficial to the, to the young people that I serve. I mean, of course, I, I would go back to the who, that, the who that, 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 that takes advantage and gets it. I, I hope that it's, you know, um, it's spread across the country. Um, also, I heard the Minister of Youth mention about a uh, farm school, you know, because we often hear that, we often say that young people are not interested in agriculture, and I would like to declare today that that's a myth. You mentioned more than once, who gets it is the question. Let's get into how come some people are not getting it and how can they get in it get it and why are they not getting it let's understand the how and the why i i i would love if i had the answers to it, but let me see if i if i can brainstorm it. so is it is it a matter of information not being available or right. is it a matter of readiness right not so, being there so to be honest it's, it's both i think right i mean Readiness, um, you know, young people who may not be, they may, okay, for example, I saw a training release recently and it says, um, you know, for you to be uh, applicable for this training, you have to have a farmer's badge, right? Farmer's badge. How do you have a farmer's badge? If you have land, if you have land, access to land and you have a deed, you have a land tenure, whether you have permission to use land, you have ownership of the land. So then right away, <clears throat> there's a whole cross section of especially the young people I serve that won't get access to that training because they have no farmer's card, right? So right away, you see, they're, they're not ready, right? Who's helping them get a farmer's card? 
That's the next conversation by itself. Then you have communication issues, of course, because look, for example, we have the, the agro incentive grant, $100,000 grant that was released on um, last, about three years ago budget, right? I think, and it's only now people start to hear about it. It's a $100,000 grant that they could get. The same thing applies again. It's very difficult to get um, land tenure issues, registration issues, etc. So I always feel like if there must be an avenue in the respective ministries, for example, that young people, do you want to, you want to, you want to apply for this? Let's come in and let's have a consultation day. And this is how we can prepare you to get ready. So again, to reiterate, definitely readiness and communicating it that, that a mass audience, because how does that young person, quote unquote, in the ghetto, who's interested, where does he go to hear about it? He, he may not hear about it. And he might be, he or she, might be the person most deserving of getting it because he ain't come from this wealthy family, he ain't come from generational business wealth, etc. and experience, you know? All right, thank you very much, Alpha. We go across to Shanice. Shanice, based on your field of expertise, what areas of the budget do you think could have been adjusted to serve you and your field better? So I believe we need to have some sort of encouraging platform or program or something to help us with getting back on track because we can't do that at home by ourselves. We need something to help us. Isaiah, I want to move the question over to you as well. I mean, we have a national station. You know, we could create a, a day or even set times on that station for people to you know, say this week we haven't spoken with poetry, this week we haven't calypso. Just like how Iowa is doing it on um, Instagram. You it's know, Iowa yeah, stage. Iowa stage, you know. And that will that would push that would push and help help more artists feel like yeah, we're not just getting pushed under the under the carpet, you know. And that will help us that will help people, you know, stop throwing these parties that is illegal right now, you know. So all of these things would help, would help us as artists and entertainers in this period of time. Well, come back and stay with you a little bit, Isaiah, because you raised that point about arts and entertainment. Arts and entertainment contributes less than 1% of the GDP in Trinidad and Tobago. And we obviously know it's because a lot of people in the entertainment industry are avoiding paying taxes. What do you say to that? <sighs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. That's a really good question. Stop my day. Stop my. <laughs> Stop my. What? All right. <laughs> Go ahead. So you say that people in the entertainment industry are avoid and paying taxes. I mean, this is your industry. These are your are your peers. What, yeah. what do you say to that? Yeah, yeah. I'm the most. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. You know, but, I, good but, question. I, but I I can't answer the question. I could step out to the moderator and be myself for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would say this. Mm -hmm. Systems and structures need to be set up and put in place in this country for people of all sectors to be encouraged and understand the, nece the necessity of paying taxes mm -hmm. and how it really contributes. Definitely. Some people will argue little weird things. They, they will argue, well, what, what the government is doing with my money, I'm not happy if, if I pay in taxes if they're doing that. But that's null and void. It's what you're supposed to be doing legally. And quite often it's what people avoid. But again, the system and the structures need to be put in place whereby if I am to pay taxes, it's, it's easy for me within my industry to do that. And I'm knowledgeable about the ways of doing it and why I should do it. I want to say this. Um, so I think it's a, it's a two-way relationship, right? So like what Hans was saying in where you need systems and structures to encourage the, um, the artists and the creatives to, to go and pay taxes. But we know when you pay those taxes, it goes to the government so that the government could invest in the country. How much is the, I mean, I'm not slamming any political party or anything, of course, but how, but how much or what percent of the budget is typically allocated to developing arts and entertainment? So, so for that creative, that artist in his mind saying, I could either take, like, keep this money, <laughs> give it, or I could give it to the government and never see it again. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to, Try, not trying to slam anybody or play devil's advocate, but... So I, I think also I wanted to add to the, to the conversation um, that things like the taxation system should be taught in secondary schools and how that money is supposed to be cycled into giving things like grants, giving, giving back to the people, giving things to infrastructure and stuff like that. 
So I think that it just needs to be implemented in the educational curriculum yeah. so that the young people could know from start, yeah, this is important. Let me, let me start to pay with taxes and things. So that's just my, my thoughts on it. Right. Okay, so as we were talking about access to education, I think that we all do have access to the education or access to the information and getting the knowledge, but I think we need to engage persons a bit more so that they could be interested in the topics. For example, if someone goes into Health Connect and they see all the pamphlets on the, um, <laughs> on the shelf, like no one picks it up and reads it, you know, but if you see a truck passing by spraying the mosquitoes, you'll be like, oh yeah, um, this could help to prevent dengue you know, or the fact that we are in this pandemic, everyone knows about COVID-19 yeah. because they are engaged, they are actively involved in the process. So I think that we don't just need access to education or, or have the pamphlets or the handouts. I think we just need to become engaged and become more involved and make people more interested in everything. Indeed. Well, we could continue that discussion on entertainment for a very long time. And my point with whether or not, you know, you all think about it and if you think about it when you get paid, and it was just for me to make the point that there needs to be a system in place where people in entertainment almost do not think about it like it just happens naturally where they are taxed which is something we'll talk about another day now let's move along um what are your thoughts guys on the government's thrust to digitize the country so i understand the need to be up with the times and keep up with the transformations but then we can't do it too quickly we still need to take our time and ensure that the country transitions the way it's supposed to. So we can't just rush digitizing. Thank you. Martha, your thoughts on the thrust to digitize the country? Well, it is honestly a good move, especially for the special needs, the, the special needs community. And who can benefit from this? For example, I have a friend who, who she's wheelchair down, right? So, so in in this instant, digitization will be of great help to her, and not only to her but to all disabled persons, knowing that they can easily access the necessary documents needed right off the internet instead of like going to the uh, yeah. actual places and so Save them that trouble, definitely. Isaiah? We have to remember, although, although it's the focus is on youth, you know, what about our parents? What about our parents' parents who are not tech savvy but, and who don't believe in the internet? But can I, can I throw something in here? Yeah. So on one end, we have Khadija saying, you know, we should take our time to do it. Mm. But on the other end, we have Martha who's emphasizing in different ways the speed it needs to be done. Yeah. So how do we strike that balance as a country is the question for you all. So I think that what they could have done is, in terms of the digitization, is what could be mobile digital and the, service, the network service providers in order to provide free mobile data to people who registered with schools, to, to students who registered with schools, right? So in that case, once they are registered, they will get free 3G or 4G, depending on where they live. And um, they could use the phones as hotspots. And if they don't have phones or they don't have um, laptops or anything like that, then in that case, they apply to ministries, they could get do a means test, they will get approved for a grant that will give them these things. So that will kind of mitigate the cost, hopefully. But B-Mobile and Digicel and these companies could very well do the hotspots and give them free data. Um, in, in their phones, so that's just my contribution to it. All right. Um, I'm thankful for what he just said because actually UE has that for our banner, so we get access to our My Learning portal from UE without having to pay for data. I think we need to prepare a bit more. It's very exhausting to be on a screen all day and we're not getting as much exercise. We don't even know the posture position that we're sitting in when we're using these devices. I think we all need to become hyper aware of these things before we just transition into doing that all day. My, my little pushback with that, I'm all for it because it, it's pushing us there. You know, so digitization, yes, but we must remain grounded. We must, we, we, can, we cannot create robots and our children are just, you know, behind a, a tablet is all in one. They forget human interaction. Because that causes a serious problem moving forward. So the balance is what I'm concerned about. 
All right, balance indeed. So what are you guys' thoughts on the removal of some subsidies and increased taxes? Alpha, no one of them that you'll be very happy about in a lot of ways is with reference to importation of certain foods. So you all, go ahead, let's hear it from you, the panel. I, I am a strong advocate for local foods. I mean, and then you'll have the flip side of people will say, well, you know, you can't get pomerac all year round, you can't get guava all year round, but I always advocate for eat what is in season, right? We, 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 we grew up here in Trinidad and Tobago that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and every panel I have to mention it. You know, we have to re-engineer that educational uh, mind and, believe, and say that a guava a day keeps the doctor away. A pomerac a day, a pom city a day keeps the doctor away. You know, so to me, if we so need apple, it have, it have um, sugar apple, it have pineapple. <laughs> you understand? So this is where we must be moving forward towards. And I strongly, um, I mean, four billion US dollars import bill. Come on, man. And we, our lands are so fertile. Our soil, we have the right temperature. So let me hear from you all. What, what do you all have to say? What do you all think? Richie, I know you've been making your points way in advance and you have them. So let me hear you on this one. As young people, the foreign use car industry, that was like, for some of us, we could have, that, that was a, re a reachable goal. If we work a little bit, we save a little bit of money, we could have buy a little aqua or something. But now, they're going to increase, they remove the subsidies, so I guess it will have more tax and stuff on, on the vehicles. So, be hard of us, because we as young people can't get loans. <laughs> so, real tough. So, I mean. And even loans, can we access the loans to, afford a brand new vehicle that's and the next big that question is the next thing, yeah the, the, the actual um, like the the actual companies that sell brand new vehicles really it, it, it is really tough because they, these cars are really expensive and you need to have like a permanent job to get in there and also another thing is to stop the um the freeze the the hiring of people in the public sector as, in, as a permanent staff so it's even harder for young people so that's just my take on on it yeah Khadija let me hear you on this Especially as you're saying that you're in between jobs and that point that Richie just mentioned. Yes, the point from Richie is important because I actually have my driving test Friday morning to get my license. So now I'm wondering how am I getting this vehicle? Because I mean, it, it's, not, it's not going to be easy because you I mean, you must have a job and you know even if you have a little money saved you know where's the money coming from for the monthly installments and then to go to a firm to get a vehicle it's this it's this figure whew. all i need to say is whew. and then you know with with regards to the food security um looking at it at the perspective of a, a young mother you know i always encourage my son to have fruits yes he will get a little grapes and yes he'll get a little apples but yeah, eat your guava. He like the guava. Eat the guava. Eat the pom city. You know, growing up with my granddad, you know, my granny had a cherry tree in the backyard. That cherry tree couldn't survive because, you know, that's what you're living on. As you reach, it's just a pick cherry. So, do you all think that the budget is aligned to the outlined roadmap to recovery? So, the roadmap to recovery, three major objectives address and mitigate hardship inflicted by COVID-19, restart the economy, and lay the foundation for sustained economic activity. Do you all feel like the 2020, 2021 budget has done this? I think the budget has done, has done a fair job at doing this, you know, especially when it comes to laying the foundation as, as well. I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about the finance sector a little bit. Um, so I like that they are trying to incentivize private investment. So they, 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 they're privatizing some, some states' own assets so that, they, that, they come, that um, individuals and young people could invest and own shares in our, in our um, states' own assets, as well as they tax incentivizing investing in the stock exchange, right? And they tax incentivizing listing on the stock exchange. But, um, but generally, yes, I do think the government, the budget is definitely in the right direction when it comes to laying the foundation for what we need to, to grow in these times. All right, guys, anyone else? Feel free to jump in here. I think that they have set the right foundation. I mean, I was very pleased to hear or nearly every single speech that our um, prime minister did throughout COVID-19 well, and continues to do so. He mentions that agriculture, he mentions farming. 
the mentions the soil, you know. And with my, my slogan that I always say, with the, if we want the reality of the soil to be the new oil and the grass to be the new gas, we must heavily invest. I mean, at some week during the, during the pandemic, we saw that a barrel of, a barrel of, of soil um, um, cost more, or cost more than a barrel of oil, you know, when the, when the oil, oil price really dropped, right? So we must be able to make that investment to foster that now. I feel as though we are hearing, definitely, we are hearing that there's, there's plans to do so. And I think the recovery, because I mean, again, during the pandemic, Food security was 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 the biggest thing. Everybody was planting. I show everybody I show nine out of ten people here planted something, right? It was it was the biggest thing. And you know, after the toilet paper scare and we got that under control, <laughs> food security became that scare. And you know, we we still trying to cope with it. We we, we you know we, we are recovering, but definitely, I think that um, we are on the right we are on the right foot. All right, so that was a little bit of focus on roadmap to recovery, the roadmap to recovery. But let's get into Vision 2030, where our country is going over the next 10 years. So I, w I want to get into it. Richie, I'm going to start with you on this one because I know you've been working very hard on your information with reference to the roadmap to re the Vision 2030. So let me hear you, your, your thoughts. Right, so it broken down into diff in varying themes, and the themes also broken down into goals, which are broken down into strategic initiatives slash actions. So what I tried to do when I was reading the Vision 2030 was try to extract how it could relate, how this, this strategic initiative could relate to youth work. So I have a few here. Um, under theme one, we have putting people first, nurturing our greatest asset, which is People. So Martha, I wanna I wanna come across to you on your thoughts on Vision 2030 and the inclusiveness that we as a country are striving for. Well, that's why I'm, I'm satisfied with the with the Vision 2030. Like I just like would like the government to like have more in place, more jobs and more stuff in place for persons with disabilities. And like persons who are wheelchairs, they will um, have more runs and stuff for them to the easy access. Definitely. So accessibility definitely is one of the things that we as a country need to continue to develop in the near future. Another point, citizens will have access to adequate and affordable housing. Do you all see this as a possibility as young people? I don't know if you all own homes or not, but this has definitely been the second biggest struggle of our generation. Our generation complains about employment, and after employment, they com we complain about not being able to afford housing do you all see this happening do you all see this as a possibility and how do you all feel about where we are right now in terms of housing i know that currently the government is in the process of of building more affordable houses for persons in the middle to low income range so i am excited to see how that venture would go forward what would be the figures coming out from those homes, you know, and how can the young individual access these homes? You know, you know what, what is the financial plan? How do we help young persons become homeowners? Azia? Um, I don't really have anything to say about the home ownership, but on the whole vision, 2030, the whole aspect of it. And what I have to say is, to Division 2030, you have to have youths who will make it to 30 to reach 2030, you know? So you need youths, you need youths who are, you know, given problems at home, who, who are in these transitional homes, who YTC, YTIC, you have to give them the opportunity, you have to give them the opportunity for them to, you know, see that there's more, more to life than what is portrayed to them. Great points, Isaiah. Alpha? 
I really want to echo my partner Isaiah points there. You know, he, he hitting real hard because, especially the point about young people having to make it to 30, is a very serious thing. So um, again, we're not digging deep into the root cause as to why these young people not living to see 30 years old. You know, and it's very, very sad as well too. To add another point that Isaiah made, you know, we often have successful programs that are working. One such program is the 40 under 40, but that was a program that I was on and it was, I, well, to me, it was working. I was going into schools and speaking with these young people and you were hearing so much positive things that was coming out of the interactions that they had. And I sure my colleague Hans could say the same thing if he takes off his, his, um, his, his moder uh, moderator, moderation hat, right? So I'm saying like programs like that, the Empower TT as well too, this, these things was okay. Why we had to start over? You know, I was named the 40 under 40 youth influencer of the year. Um, I think it was last year, you know, and what, 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 what happens with me in terms of, I should have been doing a campaign, going to schools, I'm the influencer of the year. Going to schools now, and this is the man who's, influence, who's the 40 under 40 influencer of the year. Great points, so much more than just budget 20, 20, 20, 21. So as we get ready to close, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists their closing remarks, all right? Richie, we'll start with you. All right, well, this was a really good discussion and I get a lot of feedback and different, different points of view from different young people. But all of us still have the the, how to say, vision, our youth vision as to how we want to see young people in Trinidad and Tobago as time goes by. And we want our voice to be heard and we need to get things done and done clearly so that we could know what is being done and what is being monitored and evaluated. So we could say that this was done for the youth and this is, this is me as a, as, a, as a mentor of young people as what happened five years ago. Let me say, thinking futuristically, yeah, five years ago, from five years from now, I can look back and say, this is what happened in the government. This is what happened, what they did for us. And I would like to reflect that in you as a youth, me talking to young people at that time, because I'll be old. So, older, older. older. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that is just my take on it. And I really appreciate each one of these perspectives. And it was, it was, it was just really good. Nice, man. Thank you very much, Richie. Shanice? Okay, so for youths in particular, I will be aiming at mental health concerns, education issues, abuse, bullying, even the entertainment industry, becoming a leader, all of these things. So I hope to improve the lives of these young persons negatively affected by any of these issues. And I would be delighted to just have the opportunity to assist any one of you here or um, anyone in the entire Ministry of Youth with any local, national or international plans. Let's go across to you Isaiah, you raised a lot of valid points today, let's get your closing remarks. Um, my closing remarks, um, this is a great initiative that you all have bringing youths together from different aspects and platforms. Um, what I think could be done further is the Ministry of Youth could go into different communities and have town hall meetings with there are youth just like us in all of those communities. You can go to the Beatum, there's Curry Marcel, who's on the Beatum, who's making waves, you know. And it's a different, different communities who would need something like this so you could further understand the, wide, the wider scale, you know. And not just this, this micro, micro scale that we're talking it's about. Here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Isaiah. Khadija, over to you. My advice to young persons would be, Make yourself valuable and be proactive. And allow them to know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay that although you are young, you're 25 years, yes, you might have envisioned having a new home, a new car, having a good stable job. It's okay to not be okay. Everything takes time. Don't feel as if something is not working out the way you planned it or the way you would have envisioned it, you know, that that's the end. You just give up on throwing the towel and you just let everything else just pass by it's okay to be stuck and it's okay to ask for help thank you very much martha over to you well i will just say that today was a learning opportunity for me i learned 
more about different stuff like like um I like to learn more about other special aspects of vision twenty thirty and stuff and I just want like from after today like the, for the government to show more recognition to like persons with disabilities and the society will not like look at them as persons with special needs to look at it as like normal people too and treat them as one with equal opportunities and stuff. Definitely. All right, Alpha, your closing remarks for today? We are inventors, we are creatives, we are the ones that imagine. We are, you know, we must, it's time that we take our imagination and add it towards a, pos a powerful vision and find that I in your idea and that you in your uniqueness. You know, as Kadisha said, be the best version of you. You know, we are not just one in a million, we are one in 7.3 billion. Everybody have a unique fingerprint and it's time that you activate that fingerprint to be able to really achieve, right? My message to the government also, or even the Ministry of Youth, let's not reinvent the wheel, let's make it spin. Let's re-envision our future where we be as resourceful as possible in all that we do moving forward. And uh, my colleague Richie mentioned that, you know, the voices of the youth is being heard. I think, yes, it's being heard, but we, it, 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 we don't need to just hear. You don't need to just hear it. They need to listen and respond to it as well. And finally, you know, youth is given a chance, is getting a chance at the table, I would say yes, but we need to get a chance at the table where we eat in as well too. Sometimes it is feel as though you're at the table, but you're just in the background. Yeah, really, you're getting the scrums now. You're yeah, really getting to, to eat that nice breast, you know, that nice um, chicken breast that is, right? Or turkey breast that is, right? Right, so <laughs> let me be very specific. Thank you very much, Alpha Senon. Let's head to the end of the table, Kevin Valley. I definitely can top Alpha's, uh, Alpha's closing remarks. So, you know, I'm just gonna set the expectation right there. Um, I think it was a, a great discussion today. We covered a lot. Um, my closing remarks, and I guess this is more to us as a nation rather than just to the youth, is that if we continue to invest in and develop our healthcare, our safety, modern technology, modern technological infrastructure, digitization, our agriculture, food, security and provision, environmental, social governance, entrepreneurship, and of course, our youth, I think TNT will, will become an investable country to both our citizens locally and abroad, you know, and um, well on its way to becoming a developed nation, hopefully by 2030. Thank you very much to each and every single one of our panelists. What a riveting conversation. We could definitely go on and on, but our time has definitely come to a close. The conversation doesn't end here. We would like to hear from you all. Join the conversation via our social media platforms. My DNS TT. Like the platforms on Instagram. Use the hashtags. Hashtag Youth on the Money TT. Hashtag My DNS TT. On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Development and the National Service, thank you to each and every single one of our panelists and to you, our viewers, for joining us today. I'm your host, Hans Devines, and you've been viewing Youth on the Money, a production of the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, making my DNS ours. <laughs>